Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Farron Cassidy, and I'm from the Department of Biology here in Maynooth University. Um, I wanted to welcome you all here this evening, um, both our online attendees and in person, and also a big welcome to our speaker, Professor Claire Alwell. Um, just wanted to point out that there are fire exits on both sides of the building, both at the top of the stairs and the bottom. Might be a good time also to put your phone on silent, if you wouldn't mind. Um, we will be having refreshments afterwards outside, um, just in the foyer where you walked in. And um, I would now like to welcome our Dean, Professor Ronan Farrell, to introduce our Dean's Lecture Speaker for 2023, Professor Carl. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Fearon. So first, I am delighted to welcome you all here to the 2023 Faculty of Science and Engineering Dean's Lecture uh, in person, and I believe there's quite a number of you online, so you're all very welcome. Uh, today, we are kind of, we're very pleased to see that we have guests from a wide variety of disciplines. We have some kind of school students, we have people from the healthcare sector, we have people from the universities uh, from across the country, uh, Acquired Brain Injury Ireland and Neuroscience Ireland. So we have some very informed uh, speakers and uh, you're all very welcome. Before we start, I, I would like to thank the organizers uh, kind of uh, on kind of for this event. Uh, this event is organized by the faculties uh, <clears throat> the faculty's research committee, who generously brought the life to events, and are make I'm kind of I'm happy to say it looks like we have a wonderful speaker and we have a wonderful audience. So I'm looking really forward to it. I would particularly like to call out three people who have helped make this a success: uh, Dr. Emma Whelan, who chairs the committee; kind of Dr. Kind of Farron Cassidy, who kind of and Dr. Uh, Professor Damien Woods, who helped bring the speaker here today. So thank you very much to those who, who helped there. I would also like to express my thanks uh, to all those who are supporting the event. We have student ambassadors outside. We have our videographers who are streaming it online. Kind of, we have our, uh, and our catering that hopefully we'll be enjoying uh, later this afternoon. So now I would like to say thank you and extend a warm welcome to Professor Claire Elwell, Elwell who, who is joining us here today. Professor Elwell is a professor of medical physics and biomedical engineering at the University College of London, where she is the director of the Near Infrared Spectroscopy Group and a vice dean for impact in the Faculty of Engineering Sciences. Professor Elwell started her scientific career with an undergraduate degree in physics and medical physics at the University of Exeter, where she stayed on to work in the hospital as a clinical physicist for a number of years before pursuing her PhD and later as a research fellow in the University College London in the neonatal intensive care research team for pediatric uh, children. She, there she used near infrared spectroscopy to measure newborn brain function kind of, um, for babies. Professor Elwell has received a wide range of awards, so I'm going to embarrass her, that demonstrate her excellence in public engagement. For example, the University College London Provost Public Engagement Award. And she also was won awards for her teaching and her course for the excellence of her research, including the prestigious Women in Science and Engineering Research Award. She is also the founder and a trustee of the charity Young Scientists for Africa. Her research projects focus on biomedical optics, uh, techniques, and she has ingeniously applied these to a wide range of medical areas. Her work has included um, an impressive list of topics. She has um, brain development, acute brain injury in adults, infants, sports performance, pediatric cardiology, malaria, autism, and infant mal malnutrition. She has also Kind of leads the Bright Project, which is, a, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and investigates the impact of malnutrition on brain development in infants in rural Gambia, a project which has resulted in the first functional brain imaging of infants in Africa. So a very impressive uh, project. So without going further, we are honored to have her here today for the 2023 Dean's Lecture for the Faculty of Science and Engineering. And now I would like to hand it over to Claire.
Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. It's a real honour to be here, uh, and I'm looking forward to meeting with you and speaking with you all. Um, as you've heard, my background is in physics. I trained as a medical physicist, and what I'm going to be talking to you about today are new frontiers in brain imaging, and to show how the technique that I've been working on for the last 30 years is really expanding horizons for how, when, and where we image the brain. But I'm going to start with the whole concept of medical physics. So some of you may be aware that last week was International Medical Physics Week. And medical physics really found its birthplace with this guy, Wilhelm Röntgen. And it was Wilhelm Röntgen who was experimenting with what he called mysterious beams back in 1895, who decided that they had interesting properties when they hit a variety of different materials. And he had an idea of seeing what would happen when these beams were passed through human flesh. But instead of putting his hand in the way of those beams, he asked his wife to come in and do the job for him, and thus produce the first ever X-ray image. And this really was the birth of medical physics, because it was from this first X-ray image that the whole concept of understanding the physical principles of something like ionising radiation and its interaction with the human body to produce a medical image really started the collaboration between physicists and engineers and healthcare professionals. We know from that first X-ray image that imaging now has moved on to be so much more sophisticated, and we expect so much more from our imaging than we ever did before. And in the field of brain imaging, we're used to the idea of systems that look like these, so this is an image of an X-ray computed tomography, an X-ray CT system, and the brain image that that produces. Now, you can see that this system is big and bulky, and it also relies on the use of ionising radiation. So even though it produces good images, there are limitations in the use of this type of technology for certain patient groups. Probably the gold standard of brain imaging is magnetic resonance imaging, Again, another large, bulky piece of equipment and the use of very strong magnetic fields. But the images that MRI produces are absolutely exquisite in their detail. But again, there's a limit to the number of patient groups that we can use with these types of imaging technologies. And I guess what I think of when I really think of medical physics and biomedical engineering is this definition. It's addressing an unmet clinical need with innovative engineering solutions. Now, both of those parts of that definition are so important. We do not want to solve problems that don't exist. We have to be led by the problem. We have to understand what the unmet need is. And secondly, we're engineers, physicists. We don't want to be working on the boring stuff. We want to work on stuff that's challenging and requires innovation. So as you've heard, my first job as a medical physicist was working on a neonatal intensive care unit with these types of patients. This is an infant born at 24 weeks gestation, 16 weeks premature. Now, the chance of survival for this infant is pretty good. The clinical care for these infants has really revolutionised the survival rates for very preterm infants. But the question, the unmet clinical need that was being addressed in the neonatal unit in the project that I was introduced to is, yes, we can keep these babies alive, but we want to understand more about protecting their brains because preterm babies are particularly vulnerable to different types of brain injury. And what is it that could be done in that neonatal period of intensive care that could help to protect these babies' brains? And it was that unmet clinical need, that question that came from the clinical team to a group of physicists working at UCL that prompted the idea of thinking again about how we image the brain. And for this, as physicists and engineers, a nice, comfortable place to start would be to look at the electromagnetic spectrum. So we're familiar with different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum being used in medical imaging, Radio waves are core to the use of magnetic resonance imaging, and also, most obviously, the use of X-rays, soft X-rays, lower, lower energy X-rays to produce medical images, just using a contrast method like Rockman did, or gamma rays looking at radiotherapy. 
But the area of the electromagnetic spectrum that was zoned in on for this particular unmet clinical need was the optical part of the spectrum, and particularly the region that allowed us to look at blood in a way that would not otherwise be possible. So what do I mean by that? Well, here's two tubes of blood, one containing lots of oxygen in a nice bright red colour, and one more of a deoxygenated, had some of the oxygen taken from it. So you can cl see clearly the colour difference between these two tubes of blood. And if you're a football supporter, you might compare Manchester United to West Ham, might be the description of the different colours of that blood. But we can see that visible difference in the colour of the blood just by using visible white light. But if we use white light to pass through tissue, we can also get very useful information. So if we to pass white light just through our fingers, and you can do this all just with a flashlight on your phone, you know that your finger will start to glow bright red. And that's because all of the colours are absorbed from the white light, apart from the red light, which is being reflected back to your eye. The reason that the red light and only the red light is being reflected back to your eye in that example is because your tissue contains blood and most of the blood in your finger is well oxygenated, so that blood is bright red in colour. So that's just a very simple description of using white light to understand what's going on in our tissues and to see what colour the blood is and from that to work out the amount of oxygen that it's carrying. But you can imagine that if we were to hold up a, a flashlight from our phones, we might get it to pass quite nicely through our fingertips. But if we were holding, holding it up to our head to try and get it to pass through our brain, we wouldn't have a lot of luck. And this is where we have to look closer at that part of the optical part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And instead of using visible white light, we move up the wavelengths so this red laser pointer that I've got here is about 632 nanometers. If we slide up towards 700 nanometers, we're in the near-infrared part of the spectrum into the invisible part of the spectrum. And if we pass near-infrared light through tissue, it has a very specific effect. Here's a photograph of a hand transilluminated with near-infrared rather than visible light. And what you can't see in this hand, although it's there, is the bony structure of the hand. That structure that looks so clear on the X-ray, we have a completely different contrast with near-infrared optical imaging. Essentially, the bone becomes transparent. And if the bone becomes transparent, that means we can pass near-infrared light through the skull into the brain tissue. And just as we did with our finger, we can see what color the brain glows. And therefore, we can work out how, how much oxygen it contains. And all we're actually doing, this is a plot of the absorption spectra of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. And what you can see here is that the absorption of both of these chromophores, both of these uh, compounds, is high in the ultraviolet and relatively high in the visible, but it dips significantly as we go into the near-infrared region at about 700 nanometers. And so this reduction in overall absorption is what helps us pass this light through the bone, but importantly, once we're in this region, we still get a discrimination of absorption depending on whether that haemoglobin is carrying oxygen or not. So if we looked at blood in the near-infrared part of the spectrum, it would still look a different colour, just as it did on that slide with the two different tubes. It's just that we're looking at it now through the bone and directly into the brain. So in terms of the hardware involved in uh, developing these systems, it's pretty straightforward. Um, People might say that I've spent the last 30 years working on a glorified torch, and they probably wouldn't be far wrong. But that's one of the amazing strengths of this technology. So we use laser diodes in the near-infrared part of the spectrum. This is a rather old slide, but it shows the um, transmission of that light to the head in this example via fibre optics, which is the way that we used to do this. And then the light will pass across the tissue of interest, in this case a head, now, we're going to lose a lot of light because when light passes through tissue, and if, again, if you do that, that experiment with the flashlight on your phone through your finger, you'll see the whole of your fingertip light up. And that's because scattering is actually the dominant optical effect once you pass light of this wavelength into tissue. 
And so we're going to see quite a lot of the brain tissue glow. And so when we are passing light into the tissue, we're going to lose a lot of that light because it's going to scatter away from the detector. And for every 100 million photons that we put in on one side of a baby's head, we're going to, on average, detect a single photon at the other end. So we get a lot of light losses due to scattering. That means we have to have good light detectors. But once we are able to detect the light coming from the head, compare it to the light that went in, essentially look at the change in the colour of the light, how much of the red or the blue of the light has been absorbed, then we can produce these maps of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. And this is a photograph of the type of infant that we were working on back in the 1990s that, as I say, prompted this initial unmet clinical need. And a couple of things about this photograph. This baby is extraordinarily vulnerable. The real business end here in this photograph is what's keeping this baby alive. The baby's ventilated. It's being fed via a tube uh, through its nose. It has a, a number of monitors on its chest. And so any type of imaging that we're doing with this baby has to avoid interfering with any of that life support quite clearly. And so the, the optical fibres from our near-infrared spectroscopy system are these two black probes on the baby's infant's head here. And this is really away from the business end of keeping this baby alive. So the context of these measurements is absolutely critical. And actually, going back to the photograph that I showed you earlier, on that photograph are actually two of the optical fibres going up to the baby's head and what we call optodes, the optical probes, that are shining and, de and uh, delivering and collecting the light from this baby's head are just under this little crocheted bonnet here. And so we, in this way, can provide continuous measurements of brain oxygenation at the bedside, completely non-invasively and completely safely. So the level of light that we're using to transilluminate this baby's brain is very low, um, well below the laser safety standards that we are bound to with the use of this system. Um, and because it's so low, we don't have any heating effects in the tissue. The heating effects also are um, avoided because of the amount of diffuse scattering in the tissue, so we don't have local hotspots. And this means that we can actually monitor babies of this type for hours and hours on end. Some studies have extended it up to 24 hours. So we don't need to move the baby, and everything can be done at the cot side which really revolutionises the way that we start to think about understanding um, infant brain and the way in which oxygen is delivered and used by the infant brain. And just to give you an example of the type of data that were collected in the earlier days with this very simple system with a single source and a single detector fibre, so essentially a single channel of information, I just want you to look at the red line on this plot here. So this is the oxyhemoglobin in this baby's brain. This is the oxygen, essentially the oxygen level in this baby's brain. And the scale here is minutes. So we can see that things are generally OK at the beginning, and then something happens that creates a rather dramatic reduction in the oxygen levels in the baby's brain. And what actually happened here was that the tube that was going down into the baby's lungs to ventilate the baby... Uh, got filled with secretions. And it wasn't immediately noticed because the monitors that have the alarms on them at that point is the green monitor here. The green monitor here is the carbon dioxide level in the baby's blood, which is measured through a transcutaneous across the skin, which is rather a slow monitor. But we can see that the direct brain mon mon uh, monitor is reacting pretty quickly. And at this point here, the nurses are alert alerted, the secretions are sucked out of the tube, and we get a nice return of the oxygen levels in the baby's brain. This is just a very simple example of the value of having a continuous measure of oxygen transport. Now, we realised fairly early on that there were limits to just having a single channel of information, because what we really wanted to know was what was happening to the distribution of oxygen across the baby's brain, if we really wanted to understand brain function. Um, and so for that reason, we developed a mapping system. So here's our baby's brain, and here is um, a, a number of different source and detector channels. And for this, we are passing light through each of these source and detector positions. And for each pairing, we're looking at the colour of the blood in that region of the brain and building, building up the map that you can see on the left-hand side of this slide. 
Now let's imagine that the baby's got some oxygen in their brain, denoted by these white circles. And then we do something with the baby. We challenge them in some way. We stimulate them in some way. Maybe we play them some noises or we show them some stimuli visually. And the baby starts in selected areas of the brain, starts to use up oxygen or change the oxygen concentration in various regions of the brain. And what we can pick up is the change in the colour of the oxygenation map that's related to the distribution and the use of oxygen in that baby's brain. So now we've moved from just a single channel of information to a mapping of brain oxygenation in the baby's brain. But you might be asking yourself, well, how do you attach multiple sources and detectors onto a very vulnerable baby's brain? So this was the idea of what we wanted to do, literally transilluminate this baby's brain. Uh, and this is what was built. So uh, this work was funded, it was pioneered by a colleague of mine called uh, Jem Hebden, who used to work in astronomy and had a really fantastic background in optical detectors that he applied to medical physics. Um, and so this system was developed expressly with the, um, with the view of producing these oxygenation maps in babies' brains. Now, I can assure you that this baby is just sleeping. At no point do we ever sedate or paralyse any of the babies. That would go against everything that we would want to, to, to avoid. Um, and so the engineering that went into developing this headgear, as you can imagine, was quite intense. We worked very closely with the clinical teams and, importantly, with the nursing staff um, to ensure that uh, the primary um, concern was the baby's safety um, and the baby's comfort. Uh, but we were able to develop this system uh, in such a way that these babies would sleep through these procedures. And what you can't see on this slide is that this is a 360 headgear. Uh, and actually, we developed a specially designed mattress. So the baby actually lies into a mattress, a concave mattress, that's got the sources and detector fibers at the back embedded into it already. And also, probably what you can't see is that the whole of the inside of that helmet is lined with black foam lining. So all the baby feels is that they're just encased in a foam hat. Hence, the baby sleeping very nicely. And for those of you that have had babies of this age, you know when the arms go up to the side, you know that they're actually really comfortable and sleeping well. So these are the sorts of brain oxygenation maps that this type of system delivers. Um, and we can monitor these babies during a range of different situations. Uh, one example is looking at the changes in oxygenation related to neonatal seizure. And in this situation, we can combine optical imaging with EEG to look at the electrical activity in the brain and the consequences of the electrical activity and the discharge in neonatal seizure with what's happening with the oxygenation levels in the baby's brain. So we get quite a, a, a good coverage of both what we would call neurovascular type of events happening in the baby's brain. So this has given us an idea of how we can change the way in which the image the, image the brain. And because of this advent of this new technology, we can start to consider when do we image the brain. And it's been incredible to see over the last 30 years how this technique has enabled us to measure the brain across the entire lifespan. So there are measurements that we have performed in fetuses, um, and these involve inserting a source and detector fibre onto the baby's head at the beginning of labour and measuring the oxygenation levels during labour and during childbirth to look at um, the potential issues that can occur if a baby is ha having any type of distress during labour. We can get a direct measure of the brain oxygenation. The neonatal uh, measurements I've spoken about, I'm going to be speaking about infant and toddlers, um, but we can also measure in uh, adolescence and um, really sort of ambulatory type monitoring as well as adult intensive care. So intensive care has been uh, a primary target in the early stages of the development of this technology for all of the um, indicators that I've already given. We don't need to move the patients. The brain imaging comes to them. This is a, a child undergoing uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, ECMO. Uh, this is a very delicate procedure clinically. 
uh, where there are, are two tubes inserted into the um, infant's veins and arteries in the neck. So it's very important that that head is not moved, and we were able to develop a system that uh, and allowed us to look at brain oxygenation maps in these very delicate uh, clinical situations in paediatric intensive care. And my PhD was actually transferring the technology into adults, into adult neurointensive care. And this is a patient uh, that's had a traumatic brain injury. Uh, and this system here, all the other systems here are, are looking at um, essentially markers from this, from this patient, but this is what we would call systemic markers, non-brain markers. And here's our neurofred spectroscopy system here. I'd say it's no longer a small system. This is about the size of an American fridge. It's probably a good comparison. Um, but again, the headgear is uh, safely placed on this patient. Um, I could talk at length about all of these studies, but I've chosen to focus on some of the work we're doing in infants and toddlers and the study that was mentioned in Africa. But I'm very happy to talk about this and take questions on this. I think there was a, a paper published just this week about the use of brain imaging um, to look at converting brain activity into text. And I think that's a very interesting area now for brain imaging, particularly brain imaging of unconscious patients. Um, and I'm particularly interested in working in, in really thinking about some of the ethical guidelines about how that's used. Just because we can image brains in a range of situations, I think we have to now consider, should we? and what are the pot potential sort of uh, governance issues around that. So I'm happy to revisit that question um, uh, with any of you later. Well, I am going to fo focus on, because I think it's a particular area of brain imaging um, that has benefited massively from this technology, and that's looking at young infant brains. So out of the neonatal period, really in the first year of life, and now increasingly in the first two or three years of life, this conventionally has been the black hole of brain imaging. So when you look at neonatal brain imaging, those babies are not moving, typically. They're certainly not going anywhere. Uh, once you start to get into the four- to six-month-old infants, um, you have got to develop techniques that allow these infants to do as they wish and to move freely. So the emphasis there is on getting the engineering correct so that the infants don't feel that they're having their brain imaged. And this is a particular interesting um, challenge for engineering. And this came about from a conversation I was invited into with a group of neurodevelopmental psychologists from Birkbeck College, University, London, um, University of London, uh, at the Centre of Brain and Cognitive Development. And they're situated maybe 50 yards from the engineering building at UCL, which is incredibly useful. Uh, and they invited us to go over and see some of the studies that they were doing in infants actually using EEG to look at brain activity in sort of four- to six-month-old infants. And when I spoke to them, I said, well, you're using EEG, what are the limitations? And they said, we're just not getting the spatial specificity from EEG that we want to understand enough about the developing brain. Um, and so we're interested in the use of optical techniques uh, in providing more information. So our challenge, the engineering challenge, that was the unmet need. The engineering challenge was to develop a system that would work on these infants, as I say, the initial target between four and six months of age. So we developed this UCL NEARS brain imaging system, and uh, we knew that we had to develop headgear that would enable, as I say, the baby's head to move, um, uh, but at the same time, we wanted to get a good enough coverage of our sources and detectors uh, that enabled us to, to get more spatial specificity with the um, images or the maps that we were creating. Uh, so this system was developed by another colleague of mine, Nick Everdell. Um, it uses 16 laser diodes at two different wavelengths in the near infrared, and it intensely modulates the sources um, so that we can look at multiple sources and detectors at the same time. We just demultiplex the signals to look at the location uh, that they're coming from. And this allows us to develop headgear that's got a particularly flexible approach. So, if, for example, we want to really focus on particular brain areas, brain regions, we can load the sources and detectors into that area and produce higher density information in that region. The trick with this type of system is that how do we, again, attach multiple, in this case, optical fibres to this now moving infant head? 
And this really was um, a challenge that took an awful lot of our time. I should just say, this is our first design, and we just relied on using what we had at the time, which were end-on fibres, and we embedded them in this black foam pad and then strapped it onto the baby's head. Um, it sort of worked, but not enough of the time. I would think the data dropout from this was approaching 50%, okay? So just not good enough for reliable studies. We knew it was safe, and actually the babies themselves weren't too bothered by it, but every time the baby's head moved, there was just too much movement um, in the headgear that meant that we were essentially decoupling from the baby's head and we weren't getting reliable data. So we then moved to an approach that used a glass pris a prism to bend the light through 90 degrees, and this enabled us to develop a much more wearable cap. And this definitely improved the data retention that we had, but we weren't getting such good quality data because of the light losses around the prism. Um, and so we wanted to try and improve the amount of light. We're, we know already that we're working at the limits sometimes of these detectors. We can't afford to lose light before it's even gone into the baby's head. So we then teamed up with a fibre optic company called Loptec from Germany, and they developed for us, which is fairly innovative at the time, uh, curved optical fibres. And so this really was a game changer in the way that we could then produce these optical probes that were essentially plug and play. So we could create a range of different arrays and just plug the source and detector fibres in to create the type of coverage that we needed. And this allowed us to measure hundreds, if not thousands, of babies. Now, really looking at focusing on this period between four and six months of age. And so what we were doing with these infants specifically was looking at brain function. So here's our infant with the brain imaging gear. And I'll show you in a moment the type of studies that we do with these babies, showing them a range of different stimuli, visual stimuli. And what we're doing when we do this is we are essentially activating regions of the baby's brain. And as we're doing that, we change the oxygen delivery to that part of the baby's brain. So you're all looking at me now, and you're looking at me waving my hand, you're listening to me. So the brain regions that are responsible for processing that information are working quite hard. And as they do that, they start to use up the local oxygen supply. And so an increase in oxygen delivery is promoted to that region. And so we measure that change in the color of the blood produced by the increase in oxygen delivery to these specific brain regions as a change in our oxyhemoglobin signal that I've shown you already. So this um, red increase, the increase in the red signal here is the influx of oxygen to a region where the oxygen's being used up. So it's a, like a supply demand um, signal that we're measuring. Um, and so what we're looking at here is the increase in oxyhemoglobin in response to neuronal activation. And this is really the signature to show us that we're looking at brain activation. Now, for those of you that might be familiar with functional magnetic resonance imaging and the BOLD signal, the blood oxygen level dependent signal, that really uh, originates from the decrease in deoxyhemoglobin that we also measure with NIRS. And this is generated from the washout of deoxygenated blood. As we bring the fresh blood in, we increase the oxygen levels and we wash out the deoxygenated levels. Um, and so the, the blue deoxygenated signal here is, is really the basis of the, the fMRI bold signal. So if we measure this type of signature across all of these different brain regions from all these different sources and detectors, we can reconstruct it to produce an image of brain oxygenation, similar to the one that I've shown you before. So in this um, example here, we'd say that neuronal activation is focused around this region here because we're seeing this bright spot, uh, spot on the oxygenation image. So that's the principle of what we're doing with this type of um, study. And so what we were doing in this study was looking at the infant's response to a range of different human or social cues. And that's because the neurodevelopmental psychologists we're working with are interested in looking at early markers of autism. So these babies are studied between four and six months of age, you can see sitting very comfortably on their mum or dad's uh, knee. They're engaged with the type of visual stimulus that's being shown to them. And they're also being exposed to a range of auditory stimuli. So stimuli that would be auditory stimuli that would be human, like laugh, non-language no, non human. So things like laughing or coughing or sighing, um, as, as opposed to uh, a non-social 
visual image, which, which in this case would be like a tractor or a helicopter. Something, cars are not good because they look a little bit too human. Um, and a non-social um, auditory stimulus, things like keys jangling or something rattling. So we expose the babies to this contrast in social human stimuli and non-social, non-human stimuli, and we're looking at the differences. So now this video is just going to show you what the behavioural psychologists have known for many years, that an infant's behaviour changes when they're looking at a human or social image. So just to orientate you, we're viewing this from uh, behind the screen, or filming this from behind the screen that a baby's looking at. The baby's wearing our headgear, and the baby's looking at a range of different images. Now, at the moment, they're looking at the trains, tractors, non-social images, and the baby's not very interested, fiddling with her blanket, not really that bothered. And in a moment, you'll see the actress come on the screen and do Itsy Bitsy Spider, here she is, and you can see the behaviour of that infant change very clearly. So behavioural psychologists have already known that the looking time of the infant when a human social image comes on screen extends. Um, so we know that the babies are responding to that image, but the question they had for us is which part of the brain is responsible for that infant identifying that, that stimulus as being social and human. And so this is what we were able to show. So in infants at between four and six months of age, typically developing infants, we showed an increase in oxygenation, an increase in neuronal activation uh, to the human social images compared to the non-social images. And when we looked at the different brain regions that we're measuring, we saw this um, response was focused over a region called the superior temporal sulcus, the STS, uh, which is just be behind the ear here. And it's actually the region that you're all using as adults now to interpret me as a human. Um, and what we were able to show in these infants as young as four months of age, that this brain region was maturing already at that point. Uh, so it's the same brain region that would go on and enable these infants to, to recognise human behaviour. So this was a real breakthrough in understanding what was driving the behaviour of that infant in terms of the way in which they were resp responding in the way they looked at that social image. So brain imaging now is giving us a, literally a window in to which brain regions are responsible for driving that behaviour. So my colleague Sarah Lloyd Fox, who was initially my PhD student and then moved on to be a postdoc and is now a UKRI fellow, really pioneered this work. She's a neurodevelopmental psychologist. Um, she really was responsible for honing the headgear for this, uh, these studies in babies and also coming up with the protocols that, in this case, allowed the investigation of two different groups of infants. So this is a study in which infants were studied, first of all, a group of infants at low risk of autism. And again, these, all these infants were studied between four and six months of age. Now, for context, autism isn't diagnosed typically until the second or third year of life, and it's diagnosed through clinical behavioural signs. Um, so all these studies are being um, performed way before any clinical diagnosis of autism. Um, so Sarah performed these studies in a group of infants at low risk of autism and uh, saw with the social visual stimulus, as I've already shown you, uh, an oxygenation response indicating neuronal activation to this social, social response. She repeated the study, an identical study, in a group of infants at high risk of autism and they were defined as such by having a sibling with autism which um, dramatically increases their chances of going on to develop autism um, and so, again, all, all infants studied between four and six months of age, and these were the data in the four to six months with a high risk of autism. So we can see a vastly moderated uh, response to these infants seeing a social visual response. So this work was done and published when these infants were in the first year of life, and then Sarah followed them up again um, once they had reached the age to undergo a clinical assessment for a diagnosis of autism. And what she found was, when she separated the group of infants, so only looking at the data measured at four to six months of age, she separated the data out into those babies who um, were at a low risk of autism and a high risk of autism, as we see here, and then looked at how it compared with their clinical diagnosis of autism. And what we see is the infants in the low-risk group that had a good response that were not diagnosed autistic. There was also a group in the high-risk 
um, a, a number of infants in the high-risk group who went on to not be diagnosed as autistic. But those infants in the high-risk group that had this moderated response uh, that did go on to receive a diagnosis of autism, as you can see, had a significantly different response at four to six months of age. And it's uh, also important to say that in these infants, there was no difference in the behaviour of those infants at four to six months. So the looking time at those infants at the various visual stimuli was no different. So you couldn't have detected any differences in those groups just by looking at behaviour. And this is really the first study that showed that functional brain responses that are measured very early in life, before, before six months of age, are associated with a diagnosis of aut autism in toddlerhood. So again, the idea that we can see with brain imaging things that don't become evident until quite a bit later, um, if we have to wait for the behavioural signs. So the other type of um, opportunity that's arisen from the use of this type of brain imaging is to do much more naturalistic type of testing. Um, and this is an example of some work from a group in, in Budapest um, who have been using a, a single brain imaging system, but they split the optical sources and detectors into two different headgears and measured two infants simultaneously. And so we can start to now look at the way in which babies interact with each other. And in other studies, uh, groups are looking at the interaction between babies and parents um, and looking at that initial uh, bonding or lack of bonding between uh, caregivers and their infants. And so, again, the idea of doing any of this with any, type, any other type of imaging is, is frankly impossible. So, again, extending our ambitions for how we can image the brain. And most recently... This has led to um, the opening of the world's first toddler lab, again at Birkbeck. Uh, so the work that I've shown you already was performed at Baby Lab, and now just around the corner from, toddler lab, uh, from Baby Lab, there is now a toddler lab. And what's really special about this space, amongst many other things, is the inclusion of a virtual reality cave. Um, so we can now immerse toddlers into a world where we can really start to understand the way in which they interact uh, with the world around them. And that's dependent upon using completely mobile and wearable brain imaging. So here's, again, the brain imaging that we've now upgraded so that the uh, toddlers can wear this in a little backpack uh, on their back. And um, this, uh, this child has on it a number of different brain imaging. So we've got the optical fibres We've got a couple of EEG fibres, and then the glasses that the baby's wearing are looking at eye tracking. Uh, so these have been specially designed to enable us to see what the infant is looking at and where they're spending their time gazing. Um, so we, we place this uh, onto the baby's uh, back. And then this is an example of uh, the introduction of avatars to the baby. Hello. My name is Catherine. What's your name? Hello, my name is Fred. What's your name? We have just got this new bubble machine. Who do you want to play with? So the infants or the children get to choose an avatar that they'd like to play with in the virtual reality setting. And then they go ahead and play a range of different games um, with this uh, avatar. And one of the studies that's ongoing, one of the postdocs that's working uh, in this team is looking at studying empathy in toddlers. So the idea that they would get to know an avatar of their own choice, um, and then maybe the avatar might fall over, and then we're looking at the brain response of the, of the child to what happens to the avatar, um, to look at the development of, of empathy. But the, really, the, the ambitions in this space are endless. Um, and so the combination of all of these different technologies with wearable brain imaging is really revolutionising, I think, what we're really going to understand, again, about an area, an age group of brain imaging that really hasn't been extensively studied at all. And finally, I just want to touch on the um, challenges that we've set ourselves in understanding where we can image the brain. So everything that I've shown you so far, and actually my career up to 2011, was entirely focused on extraordinarily high-resource settings, I was lucky enough to work at a centre of excellence for brain studies in London, uh, both clinical studies in neurointensive care, 
Burt Beck with these amazing facilities looking at babies and toddlers. Um, and during this time, I got involved with a study looking at cerebral malaria, um, which involved us sending a system out to India um, to look at the impact of malarial coma on patients. I didn't go to India with the system. We trained some medics up in our lab and sent them off with the kit to India. Um, and we published... It, the study actually didn't go very well. It, it, it didn't pan out as we hoped it might. There were some technical issues um, in, the, in the hospital where we were trying to do the measurements. But I was very keen that the postdoc who'd worked on that project incredibly hard got some output from the study. So I encouraged her to write up a conference proceedings paper of five pages um, just to, to uh, report some of the findings, although limited findings, that, that we had got. And I had to be honest with her and say, you know, I think you need to write this paper, but I really am not sure who's going to read it. Um, and it turned out that somebody did read it. And this person was uh, Andrew Prentice, who works at the Medical Research Council International Nutrition Group. So Andrew and his colleague Sophie Moore are based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and their colleague, Momadou Darbo, is based at a field station in rural Gambia. And they read our paper around the use of our uh, systems in India in a global health project, and they also had read our papers looking at the use of the system to measure infant brain development. And they came to me with this question, could we use near-infrared spectroscopy to investigate the effects of malnutrition on infant brain development in this setting in rural Gambia? And actually, they came to the lab where I work with this question when I happened to be away in Washington delivering a talk. And actually, I was in the talk that I was delivering in my conclusions. I said, I think there's something untapped here in global health we need to look into. And so it was rather coincidence that those two things were happening at the same time. I spoke to them and said, I don't know anything about global health. I don't know anything about malnutrition. I've never been to the Gambia. In fact, I've never been to Africa. So you're going to have to educate me pretty quickly. And it was quite an education. So 150 million children worldwide are malnourished. Half of the children in the world live in poverty. And the risk factors for those children include under and malnutrition, so not enough food and not the right balance of food, a range of infectious and non-infectious diseases, low quality health care, and inadequate provision of early years education. Things that we take for granted here uh, that our children will have access to. And the consequence of that, as really focused on in a paper from 2016, um, is one in, three every, uh, in, one in every three preschool-aged children living in low- and middle-income countries are failing to reach, their, re reach basic milestones in their cognitive or socio-emotional development. So this is a real problem about the impact of this early adversity on infant brain development. And the vast majority of those infants are living in sub-Saharan Africa. So this was the background that I was given to the scale of the problem. And then I said to the group in the Gambia, what are you currently doing to understand infant brain development in the infants that you're studying? And they said, we are measuring the size of the infant's head. Now, this actually is a very good and practical measure and very easy to implement. And the data from these measurements of head circumference in the Gambian uh, infants, so this is a cohort of infants born in the West Kiang region of the Gambia. This is a Z-score of head circumference uh, as a function of age for boys and girls. And normal healthy growth would be on or above the green dash line at the top. And we can see that all of these Gambian infants in this region are failing uh, to achieve that head growth. So they have head growth faltering. And so, not unreasonably, the, uh, the suggestion is, if the heads are not growing, uh, why not? Is that because the brain isn't growing sufficiently and not developing in the way that it should? So this is a marker, which is incredibly useful. Um, but, again, it doesn't tell us what's actually going on inside the brain. So that hooked me into this problem, even though I really didn't... I felt very much out of my depth. And I said, OK, if we're going to do this, we're going to need some cash. And at this point, I was introduced to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which, like many of us, I just heard of, uh, but didn't really know very much about. But I was specifically introduced to the Grand Challenge Exploration Grant Scheme, 
And I like the sound of this for the following reasons. The uh, applications were short, which is always good. In fact, they were only two pages long. And the budget section was two lines. Very nice. Uh, and they encourage daring and unconventional ideas. And because I had absolutely no idea whether this was going to work, that sounded like a good thing. The initial slug of money was $100,000. Uh, but if you got through phase one and showed some value of the work that you were doing, you could apply for phase two. The success rate for phase two funding at that point was less than 1%. So it was a carrot, but it was a very small carrot a very long way away. But I had my eye on the fact that there was extra money potentially that we could get our hands on. So with $100,000, the day it was transferred into the UCL account, it was a bad exchange day. It was £57,000. Uh, we managed to build a scaled-down system of a brain imaging system, uh, a version of a brain imaging system, and we put it in a box and carried it with us as excess luggage out to the Gambia. Um, along with some other pieces of kit that we had in our suitcases, uh, this was our brain imaging setup when we arrived at the field station. Now, the field station at that point uh, had a, uh, no running water or electricity supply. It had an electrical generator and a water borehole. Uh, but we were given a disused uh, space to enable us to do some studies, uh, not at all like the space that we were used to working in in, in baby lab. Um, and this is what happened that morning once we got all the boxes out of our various cases. Uh, within an hour, we had set the system up pretty much uh, as we would do in the UK. Within an hour and a half, we were training our local field worker, Seiku. Um, and in just over two hours, we had our first mum and baby come into the lab for a study. And a few minutes later, we were replicating a study that we'd done many times in the UK. The study, again, where we look at social and non-social. The only adaptation we'd done was refilm the videos with Gambian actors. And then just a few minutes later, we had completed our first brain imaging study, and this little chap looks very surprised, uh, and as he should be, because we were. Uh, it turns out this is the first baby to have their brain imaged in Africa. Uh, and this was 2012. It's a bit crazy that it took this long, because all we really did was put a brain imaging kit in a box and take it out there. <laughs> uh, we were very keen to look at the data to see whether it had worked. And these are the plots from different channels of this headgear that we acquired from that first infant. And what I really just want you to look at is the red line showing the increase in oxygenation, again, indicating neuronal response. And what's encouraging for me about this was that it wasn't apparent on every single channel. There was some spatial selectivity in where this response was occurring, and that convinced me that this was, was good data. So it was very tempting to stop at n equals 1 at that point and pack everything up and come home and say that we've done it. Um, but the idea that we've got some spatial responses that were similar to those that we saw in the UK meant that we had a good working protocol. And so we stayed on that visit and studied another 41 babies between four and eight months of age. That was the group that we were most familiar with studying in the UK. Uh, we then followed these babies up at nine to 13 months and at 12 to 16 months. And you'll see that the number of babies has decreased. We had a couple of babies move away, uh, but we also had two babies die. And that was really a stark reminder of the population challenge that we were working in. Uh, we also added some cross-sectional studies uh, at, uh, within the first couple of months of life and up to the second year of life. And this was to satisfy what we promised the Gates Foundation, which was to show proof of principle of this technology over the first 1,000 days of life. And they count days of life from conception, so that really is up to the second birthday. So we've never studied all these different age groups at that point. This is way before Toddler Lab was opened. Um, so it was encouraging for us to show that we could use the technology uh, across those different um, age groups. And the next thing I'm going to show you is a video of a little chap who I just love this video because it was one that we showed to consent mums and babies into the study. Because if someone comes to you and says, we'd like to do brain imaging on your baby... Uh, we don't use the word lasers, but essentially we're going to fire lasers into your baby's brain. Um, it's, um, you know, very scary, uh, potentially. So this... Is just, sorry, it's quite loud, the, the volume. That's the non-social sounds that you can hear, the keys dropping. So he's looking at a social image. So you can see on this mirror here what he's looking at. Uh, oh, sorry, the, he's looking at the actress, the social image at the moment. And what you'll see in a minute is that he'll 
start to mimic what he's seen on the screen. But the thing that really comes across in this video is how naturalistic this is, how comfortable both he and his mum are having, uh, being caught. These are sort of gurgling noises that are the, the non-social images. Uh, and now he's just going to do peekaboo just to look super cute. Um, so the idea that people said to us, you won't get this to work in Africa, you won't get it to work on dark skin and dark hair, as if we are not presented with those infants in London, and you won't get it to work in toddlers. I just show them that video. <laughs> and, say, and the data we got from that little chap is very good. So because we realised that this was a first, and we were really, I think, pioneering this new research field, i never done this before with a project, but I decided to brand it. And we called it Global Ethnears, and we published very quickly the results of our first study. And then I decided to take a sabbatical, uh, which took me all over the world, because I needed to understand the context uh, more about these challenges in global health. And I went to many global health conferences as the only non-global health person there, certainly as the only sort of physicist stroke engineer at these conferences, the mad woman talking about brain imaging. Because for good reason, global health researchers had never understood or thought possible that brain imaging was within their reach, was something that they could implement in their studies, even though they wanted to. They hadn't seen a technology that would enable them to do that. One of the... Um, uh, visits that I did as part of this sabbatical was to the Gates Foundation in Seattle for a, a conference of, for Grand Challenge awardees like myself. And that included a, a poster session. Um, and there were about 400 posters in this session, and it was very busy. Um, and without, zero, without any warning, this chap came and spoke to me. So uh, my colleague took this photo and timed the interaction I had with Bill Gates, which was seven and a half minutes. <laughs> um, so I show this as an example of the value of science communication. I had no idea this was going to happen, but I knew that this was an incredibly important elevator pitch. We'd got some initial funding, but I was really pushing hard to get a lot more money out of the Gates Foundation, basically out of his pocket. Um, so I just tried. He's a tech guy. I knew that he wouldn't know the detail of what I was talking about, and the background, but I knew that he'd be lit up by the technology, excuse the pun, so I was really trying to get him excited about the potential for this technology. And this conversation, plus a site visit to London, plus the extraordinary amount of work by the entire team, led us to another tranche of funding that enabled us to set up the Bright Project, the Brain Imaging for Global Health Project. Um, and this is a project that's really expanded into something of a monster that I never imagined that I would be leading. Uh, we basically recruited infants in the Gambia in the UK, 225 infants in the Gambia, 60 in the UK, and followed them up from birth to five years of age with a range of different assessments. We looked at their home environment, caregiving practices. We did brain imaging with both near-infrared spectroscopy and EEG. Uh, we did behavioural measures of eye tracking, parent-child interaction. We looked at qu uh, questionnaires. We did biological samples, growth measures, infant development. And we looked at parental mental health. And this study now is producing the most incredible um, wealth of data of a population that's never been studied in this way before. Um, and it started by looking at brain imaging, but I knew that we had to put the brain imaging into context. Again, as I've said many times already, how does the brain imaging add value to what we already know from the behavioural markers that we have? And what was really rewarding was I went to a, a near-infrared spectroscopy conference and spoke about this work and really gave a call to arms to other researchers in the field again and said, we need to start looking at our responsibility as developers of technology of how we can apply it in global health settings. And as a result of that, we have a collaboration now with a group in, uh, studying infants in Bangladesh. These infants have different early adversity challenges uh, many of them are born in urban slums, so there's a high degree of diarrhoea disease. So they might have access to nutrition, uh, but the diarrhoea means that they're not absorbing the nutrients that they should do. Uh, so we developed a system for them to use, and we shared our protocols with them, and they just refilmed them with Bangladeshi um, actors. And so we now have this um, 
situation where we've got the same measures being made with the same systems over three different continents in three different types of populations. Um, so we're now enabling our, our, um, these researchers to provide uh, cross-cultural comparisons in a way that they haven't been able to do before. And we basically set up a new research field of global ethnies. Um, this slide is a little bit out of date now, but just to show that there are many studies uh, now being added to this endeavour to produce brain imaging globally. And this is a great example of a mobile brain imaging lab in the Ivory Coast. Uh, so a researcher is looking at literacy in children who mostly work on um, cocoa farms and to see what the impact of lack of education is in these um, children. So she just goes to these rural villages and has a pop-up tent within which is a brain imaging uh, laboratory. And as I said, we have a wealth of different outputs here, and I don't really have time to go into them all now, but the, this slide is just to show that we are reaching a range of different audiences. So clearly, developmental science is leading. Uh, we've published on Gates Open Research to, so others can replicate our methods, but also in the brain imaging community to show the possibilities of extending brain imaging into this area. And I guess because I'm either crazy or ambitious, um, or both. Uh, my next idea is to see whether we can get a solar panelled brain imaging system on the back of this motorbike. Um, this is a field assistant who really is a key to lots of the work that we did in uh, the Gambia. Uh, so uh, Mamadou would go out and consent uh, mothers and, 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 and fathers and their infants for our study. And then we would arrange for those families to be brought in via Land Rover to our clinic. So I'd like to cut that particular part of the process out and have Momadou carrying the brain imaging system on the back of his bike and have proper screening um, actually in the compounds and in the communities. Because the challenge I set my team was we're competing with a tape measure. So even though we think our imaging is, is non-invasive and easy to use, you know, we are competing with a simple tape measure. Um, so let's see how, how we can create a system that enables us to deliver um, at the point that it really needs to be um, uh, completely accessible. So I'll stop there by thanking everyone who's really produced the data and the slides that I've shown you this evening and the, the funders for the work. And as you can imagine, it's been a real cross-disciplinary effort, both in terms of funders but also in colleagues um, from a number of different disciplines. And a particular thanks to the whole of the Gambian team who've made the Bright Project possible uh, and without whom we really wouldn't be able to have even thought about doing this work. And one of the uh, real other ambitions is to create a centre of excellence for capacity building in Africa so that these extraordinarily talented African scientists can become the trainers of other African groups looking at brain imaging. Thank you very much. so much for your fantastic talk and for bringing that outstanding research to us here in Minute. Um, before we move to refreshments outside, we do have time for questions and I'm sure there are some um, in the audience here. We've had a few coming in online already. Um, I don't have a questions mic, unfortunately, so if you wouldn't mind just putting a tiny bit of context into the sure. mic when, um, when questions come to you from yeah. the audience. Yeah. Um, if there's no one jumping out of their seat right now, I might do a couple of the audience um, online audience questions first, and then at any point, um, feel free to, to put your hand up, um, and I'll come to you. Um, so the first question that we had online was, is there any correlation in the use of fibre optics in ASD sensory rooms and brain oxygenation in that kind of setting? No, but that is an area that we're clearly wanting to move into. I think now that we've got... Uh, so the toddler lab is much bigger than the virtual reality environment that I showed you. It contains a number of different types of spaces um, where we can provide naturalistic settings for looking at the behaviours of infants, but also to think about interventions. Um, I think what we've been working so hard to do is to get to a place where we can image babies' brains really without them knowing that that's what we're doing. Uh, and I think only when you've got to that place can you say we can really start to look at the impact of interventions. And because of the ease of application of this technology, it means we can bring infants in repeatedly, just as we've done in the Gambian study, 
we can really look at longitudinal measurements, which are really key if we're starting to look at uh, interventions and a range of different interventions. And I think that what's um, rewarding as a sort of physicist engineer in this space is that we really feel that we're delivering incredibly useful tools for the neurodevelopmental psychologists to really let their imagination run wild with, of how they can use them, particularly for that type of intervention. Um, Absolutely. I think you've really tracking. demonstrated the kind of breadth of application of the technique today as well. Um, another question that we had online was um, asking what your thoughts are on the use of, the, um, of transcranial stimulation using the near-infrared light in treating um, or studying neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah, so um, the idea of transcranial stimulation is a, is a particular type of technique which relies on either magnetic or electrical stimulation. Um, so there's been work done in Parkinson's patients uh, with that. The role that neurofluorids has played in that area partly has been in patients that have metal implants. So uh, ordinarily, you would really want to do quite high um, spatially resolved um, structural imaging in these patients. Uh, but that, you can't do that if they have a metal implant. You can't do that with, F, with MRI if they have a metal implant. Um, so near-infrared is being used in some studies to provide measurements of function in Parkinson patients and their response to that type of stimulation. So I think it does have a role. I think that um, as with everything that we're doing, we really need to, again, I'm going to use this, overuse this phrase, but it's so important, we need to know what the unmet need is. So for those patients where um, you can get them into a high-resolution MRI scanner, get them into a high-resolution MRI scanner. Um, so we need to know where the specific value of this type of imaging is for different types of patients. But that's a good example uh, where work is being done. I don't have the details, but there's definitely work being done in that area. Brilliant. Great to hear. We have a question here. Yeah. Sarah, a wonderful presentation. Um, when, when you're creating your brain images and your mapping, are you just looking at cortical regions or are you able to look at subcortical regions and differentiate the subcortical regions? Yeah, it's a really good question. So I could have filled, as you can imagine, an hour on the image reconstruction. Um, so it depends on the type of system that we're using. So the system that I've described here is what we call a continuous wave um, system, where we're looking at changes in intensity. So there are time domain systems where we can look at changes of time and flight. So those systems have been used to look across a whole um, infant's head. But there's a limit. Because of the amount of attenuation of the signal, we're limited to about 7 or 8 centimetre diameter. So with those systems, you're looking at full transmission, and you can start to look at deeper cortical structures. But you have to be minded by the fact that you're looking then at... Um, using Monte Carlo modelling of photon density to, to look at the amount of light that's reaching different regions. So there's the physics limits you there, and essentially it's the scattering that limits you there. But that's an application that's also been used in breast imaging. Um, so there are systems now that are non-invasive breast imaging systems where a woman will lie on her front and there'll be a cup that the breast sits in and the optical fibers, just in the same way that they wrapped around the baby's head, will wrapped around, wrap around the breast. And we can look at differences in oxygenation um, across regions of the breast that might be indicative of uh, tumor um, um, angiogenesis. So um, the answer is yes, we can look at deeper structures in the cortex, but we need to have the correct type of engineered system to do that. So most of the maps that I've shown you have been maps of cortical oxygenation. And for lots of the applications, that's where lots of the interesting stuff is happening. Yeah. Excellent. Um, we actually have a few more online questions as well. Um, so you had um, mentioned about um, skin and hair colour and that there had been discussion as to that these might affect the results. And um, there was a question just regarding the effect of those on data gathering? Yeah, so I think... Uh, OK, so I... Actually, after the malaria study that we did, I wrote a grant to the Medical Research Council on a whim, really, and said, I think we should be doing more brain imaging in global health, and maybe malaria is a good initial target. 
And you know when you get reviewers' comments on a grant and you think, oh, what's the overall feeling? There wasn't any of that. It was an absolute resounding no. It was, it was absolutely trashed, the grant. And, and one of the criticisms was, um, why don't you use MRI? That's oh, because it's generally not available in these settings. And uh, the skin and hair colour will be a real challenge optically. And I knew that wasn't true because of the number of dark-skinned babies we'd already studied in London. Um, and when we went out to the Gambia, just as a provision, uh, we engineered the system so that we could just slightly increase the exposure, um, the intensity uh, of the instant light going into the baby's head. We never needed to use that. Um, so I think, you know, the, the theory shows that it's not a problem, but there just seemed to be this thing. Now, the thing that's important is that things don't change during the study. So if you have something else, like a much bigger effect that you should be aware of, is particularly in adults, if you did something that made the skin blood flow change, that would be problematic. So we did a sequence of studies to test a system where we gave people in our lab anagrams to solve. And they were variously good at solving anagrams, but worse than that, they were really over-competitive about solving anagrams. <laughs> and when they realised they weren't going to solve a particular anagram, uh, they got quite het up, or they got quite embarrassed, and then they started to blush. And that was not good, because then we had a change in a sort of what we call an extra cerebral layer um, during the course of a study, which is not good. But things like skin colour are not going to change. The hair was interesting... Uh, m more to the point, it's about making sure we've got good coupling of the headgear onto the infant's head. When we started to measure older infants in the Gambia, lots of the girls had their hair braided, and we knew that we couldn't place our sources and detectors over the braids. So we spoke with the local mums and showed them the headgear design that we had, and they came up with a braiding pattern uh, so that we could place our sources and detectors around the braids. So, you know, it was... It's not rocket science. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, yeah, it's not a problem. And uh, as long as you're working in collaboration with the people that are helping you with your research, then you can overcome most of the problems. Brilliant. Um, there was another question online um, regarding confounding factors, and the question was regarding that different children um, might have different um, familiarity with screens um, mm, yeah. before coming into your study, and would that have any impact on the results? Yeah, so what's really interesting is that we saw a real change from the beginning of our study, um, even over the last... So we started our Bright project in the UK and the Gambia in 20... We actually started data collection on the main project, longitudinal project, in 2015. And there has been a big change in screen use in the UK infants at that time. And so we introduced separately what we call a tablet task, uh, which is looking at an infant's association with using a, a touch screen. Um, in the Gambia, most of the infants have not interacted with a touch screen. They will have seen a mobile phone, but not seen it as something that they interact with. Um, so we have had to look into how that might affect. Now, what we, are, what we should just remember is that the screen is just a conduit on which we deliver a stimulus. And we're always looking at a difference between two stimuli. So um, that's really something that we have to bear in mind, that we're constantly looking at a change within a, within a set context. But it, yeah, it's definitely true that the behaviour of infants and screens has changed, uh, uh, even in the last few years. Uh, yeah, Danny. Um, great talk. Thank you very much. I had two questions, if that's okay. Um, so the first was, um, thank you for showing error bars on your uh, autism prediction, right? But the error bars were quite high on yeah. the tricky problem of predicting autism for yeah. three to four months old. Is that just a simply a matter of getting more data, or is there a limitation in the approach? Uh, it's definitely a data problem. And I think the biggest challenge that we have now is to convert that group data into individual. Yeah. So to be able to say with confidence that this infant is likely to go on to have an autism diagnosis on the basis of the responses that we're measuring at uh, four to six months. 
So what's happening in autism research is multi-centre studies across Europe. So there's a large uh, study called BASIS, which is happening across multiple centres in the EU, uh, specifically for that region of pooling um, data, um, because we're, we're limited to accessing those infants that, that are at high, risk of infant, at high, high risk of autism to start with. So I think predominantly it is a numbers game. Question. Okay. Um, so, maybe a bit more speculative. Um, um, is, there, is there much room? So, you're, you're looking at near infrared, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know, I guess you're picking up changes in hemoglobin uh, protein size or something. So, by yeah, tweaking the um, frequency, do you think there are other things you could pick up uh, other than blood oxygen? Yeah, so the whole talk that I could have done in an hour, which I didn't, and I chose not to mention it at all because it's a bit of a, um, it's hard to mention briefly. There's a chromophore cytochrome oxidase that sits in the middle of the near infrared. It's got a much broader absorption peak, so you need many more wavelengths to spectrally resolve the changes. But it's actually what you want to measure, and actually the person that first developed near infrared spectroscopy for in vivo studies was a guy called Franz Jobsis, and his initial target was looking at the redox status of cytochrome oxidase. So it sits in the respiratory electron chain, and it's essentially an enzyme which is responsible for oxygen utilisation. So it's, it's what you want to know. Uh, we can measure that. We've got great studies in adult brain injury. We've had a lot of focus on using that in adult brain injury, and also now in infants. And we've got some really interesting data looking at oxygen metabolism, which is what that enzyme gives us um, in autism, high-risk autism studies as well. So, um, yeah, that, that again is, um, uh, it, you just get it for free, right? Because it sits in the middle of the, the spectrum that you're already measuring within. Um, and that's something that myself and a colleague have been working really hard on in the last sort of 10 years to really bring forward. Um, and I think it won't be long between before these systems incorporate that measurement capability in them. Thanks. Okay, I think we better wrap it up there on the questions, um, but we will be moving outside for refreshments and um, Professor Ella will be um, joining us for refreshments, so hopefully you may be able to approach her um, as I see there are a few more people with questions, um, but we just don't have time. So um, I would just like to invite up our Dean, um, Professor Ronan Farrell again, to uh, formally thank Professor Clara Well for um, coming to give the Dean's lecture. So on behalf of the faculty and everyone here, I would just like to say thank you very much for a wonderful talk. And we have a small gift for you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.